So we know we are uh, reading two portions here in America and one portion in Israel, Masa'eh. Basically, we're finishing the book of Ba Midbar. That's what we're actually doing. And the important is that we know that the Torah has uh, five books, and the first four books related to God, and the last book related to Moshe. I mean, both way, I mean, five books of Moses, basically, uh, both of them was given by God, but the writing, the summarize of the full book of Moses, uh, written by Moses himself, is a book that summarizes everything that the Israelite went through. So basically, this is the end, this is the actual end of everything that has to do with uh, the Torah as it came from God. And the week after that, we're starting the book as it come from Moses. Now, what does it mean for us? I mean, why do we need to know that? It's a very simple, the name of the book in Hebrew, it's called Bamidbar, in the desert. So we basically finishing the desert tikkun, and we go into Dvarim. Those of you who know a little bit Kabbalah, we know that the five books represent Keter till Malchut. So we're finishing the Eran Pin, the end of the Eran Pin, and we're moving into Malchut next week, into manifestation as we approach the Chagim, specifically Rosh Hashanah. Now, we also need to remember, we are this week, the end of this week, is the beginning of the month of Leo. And it's almost the punishing the Leo by giving them a month that starts always bad. The first nine days can get married, can swim, can drink, can dance. There's a lot of can't. There's basically not a lot you can do. Don't eat meat. Oh, I forgot that. No meat. Don't cut your hair. I mean, there's nothing left. So what, what do you do with yourself? You know, and after nine days, you do the famous fast. But that fast is basically taking care of a lot, a lot of issues. It's a very powerful fast that a lot of people, unfortunately, don't know about it. It's a 25 hours fast that uh, clean all the negativity. Not like Yom Kippur, because Yom Kippur is 25 hours that you climb into such a high level that you don't need food. Here, the fast is because it's so negative that if you take anything physical, the negativity stays with you for the whole year. Two different reasons. So Yom Kippur, you're on such a high cloud, different rules apply. No food, no drink, no nothing you need. You don't need the food. Tisha B'Av, the ninth day of Av, is because it's the day that's controlled by the Dark Lord, okay? This is his day. This is when he's controlling everything. Yom Kippur is the one day year that is not allowed to be. So interesting, right? Yom Kippur, no, no negative force. Tisha B'Av, negative force, full control. And both day, you act the same. So it's kind of weird. Why would you behave the same in both day, where in nine days of Av, you are actually uh, behaving with uh, the whole idea of fast, and Yom Kippur, it's also the same behavior. The only difference is on Yom Kippur, if you do the fast, it's for the reason that you elevate yourself to such a high level of spirituality, and in Tisha B'Av, you're preventing yourself from loss of money, loss of health, or all kind of things like that, because unfortunately many times people get confused of who they are. And if you want to define yourself, who are you? I want to see a person who can define who they are without this study. Nobody. Usually if you tell people who are you, they tell you what they do for a living. That's as far as people go. 
Who are you? Uh, my name. Uh, who are you? Uh, who are you? Can you skip the name, skip your profession? So to define who you are, you have to define two things in your life. What you want, and how much of what you want you can let go. If you don't know those two answers, you don't know who you are. What you want, what you desire. Second question, can you let it go? No, then you're nothing. You're just a robot. If you ever see the Muppet Show, it seems like they have a personality, right? They don't control the show. It's like people killing Leonardo DiCaprio right now. He did the new movie, I guess. And the question they had to ask him is why didn't you survive in the Titanic? It's a true question, it just happened this week. You know, he had the, that, I don't know if you remember the scene, I don't remember the old detail, but it was a piece of wood or something. Yeah. Uh, am I right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so he said, okay, they asked him on TV, why would they bother him with it? Why couldn't you just survive? <laughs> and he take turn. I thought the one person asked him, they keep asking him that. I don't know if they just, Was this his choice? He didn't even write it down, right? And then, the same thing about you. If you want to know if you have free will, you have to ask two, th two things. What, what do I want? I want to eat. That's who I am. I like to eat. Can you say no? No. Then you are a Muppet show. You are nothing more than... That's it. Your control can only be after you define your desire. And then you know your control. So in this time, right now, astrologically talking, or energy-wise, it's not an easy time. It's a time that you define your power. You know, a lot, of, a lot of people get scared of spirituality, get scared of religion, get scared of meditation, get scared of something you gotta do. Nobody's against vegan, because vegan known that you're gonna give you another 20 years, you know? Like yoga, yoga, vegan, everybody's into it. It seems like the right thing to do. You get your mat, you eat avocado, you are the right person, right? <laughs> Everybody like it. You know, but if you go and become spiritual, eh, too much commitment, I gotta do it every day, be nice to people, forgiveness, I'm losing money, eh, too much. But the idea of spirituality is a commitment. Spirituality is a commitment you gotta do every day. You can't do spirituality if you come to the lecture. Oh, very nice, this guy spoke about something, I understood 20%. Okay, no, not so bad. You, know, you have some accent, but good lecture, you know. And then you go home. What do you do after you leave that door? I did my spirituality share. In this time, right, right now as we speak, right now, this time, for the next two weeks, heavy. You gotta be careful. You have to act spiritual. Why? Because the energy that exists right now everywhere is fighting. Everybody wanna fight for the right reason. Nobody fight for the wrong reason, right? Everybody fight. People kill each other for a uh, spot, for parking. If you're asking them why you're fighting, it's for the right reason. Those of you who ever work with the, in a rehab or in a prison, people have reasons why they did bad. They're not bad people. They tell you this is the reason I did what I did. It's not that they did it because they're bad people. I had to kill that person, or I had to steal, or I had to do what I had to do. So people is not like bad people. Right now, the energy is the energy of righteousness, meaning I want to be right. I want to say what I want to say. I want to punch people in the face for doing the wrong thing. I'm saving. This is the energy right now. So the other day, you know, I'm going to a place of meditation. Didn't expect something like this can happen there. And I'm arriving. And sometimes, you know, when you arrive to a place of prayer and meditation, and you arrive, you can feel, I'm sure all of you are sensitive enough for the energy, you can feel that the energy was off. So I'm seeing the instructor, very famous person, very nice guy. Not strong personality, but good human being. So I'm getting there, and I see that he's sitting like depressed. So we friend, I said, man, <laughs> what, what happened? I see next to him there is a guy with a shirt, a tear in his shirt. So yeah, I got the picture, but I want to ask the instructor. What happened? This is a very nice place. We meditate, we love, peace. So anyway, you just been late five minutes ago. Two guys were trying to kill each other here. I said, what? Why? What happened? He said, I have no idea, Leo. 
Then he looked at me and said, do you know anything about the energy? Something is off? I said, everything is off right now. Let me tell you, everything is off. So what do we do? I said, well, we, we have to climb to the next level. We have to help those people. The idea is right now, be careful. No argument, no fight, especially when you feel in doing it for the right reason. People kill each other for the right reason, still for the right reason. Nobody doing it for the wrong reason. Nobody. If you talk to them, why did you punch that person in the face? Why did you break the window of your uh, neighbor? Why did you hate this girl and punch her in the glasses and the glass went into her eyes? A thousand cases came to, come to see me every day. <laughs> so they tell you, well, she stole my husband, he stole my wife, he took my money, all the right reason. We can't do that, can't do that. We have to act specifically the next two weeks with human dignity, and I know it's hard, because we're human beings, and as a human being, we have three levels to the soul. And the lowest level of the soul is called animal kingdom soul. And the animal kingdom soul has to do with survivals, okay? And, and that bringing us like, we want to fight. You know, you ever see a dog? Eh, my dog doesn't do it, I try, I mean, you get your hand into the food and they, you know, it doesn't get angry, I don't know, is something, something wrong, it's supposed to be upset. You know, and some dog do that when he touch the food. Today I gave him a bone, so I said maybe now he's gonna be upset. He doesn't want to get upset. So sometimes when somebody takes something from us, we do that without that noise. You know, not cool. You know, you see a lot of time. I will end up with that little story before we going deep. I saw one time. I saw a scene like that: two beautiful women in the bar, dressed. Perfect, like they jump out of the Vogue magazine. You know, they have orange and yellow, you know, it's like the old, what do you call it? The, what do you have? We have red, where my family says it's yellow, orange, a red, a red orange, and, and green. A woman dress, you know, with a high heel that you can walk one inch and you will die, you know? So, if you have a fear of height, especially. So, they're both standing, it look elegant and intelligent and everything. Until a guy show up. And I'm sitting a little bit far, waiting for my wife. And all of a sudden, those amazing women, intelligent conversation, holding the, uh, those glass that I think it's called martini in a nice, the finger going away. So you, you believe this is a chess master, right? All of a sudden, this guy, she knew him. I don't know, it, it was a little far. And the argument began and it ended up with a fist fight. Two beautiful ladies. And I said, what is going on here? Happened to be also in this time. So we are talking about the time that is heavy. Stay away from argument. Stay away from argument for all of us. Anyway, the portion, the story of this parasha, it starts with somebody making a nether. The word nether is a vow. Vow or promise. You ever make a promise to somebody? You ever make a vow? Anybody ever promise and ever kept it? Ever happened to you? Ever happened to you, event? It did? Never. Not this lifetime, right? No, we, we, we keep our promise. We are good people. Now, what's the big deal that the Torah, in the end, before Moses died, he said, hey, wait, everybody. Can you imagine, wait? I need to tell you the most important thing before Moses died. This is it. This is it. Don't ever promise. Don't ever make a vow. It's called neder. Don't ever say you will do something and don't do it. What's the big deal? What's the big deal? I mean, everybody today promised. I mean, you look at the government, they promise you everything before the election, right? Every November, four years, I will change everything, right? I mean, every day. Women promise to men, men promise to women, owner promise to worker, worker promise to, to owner. Every day is, is we, we live of promises. Because the promises fulfill us before we deliver, right? I mean, every man, today men become super manipulator, girls find manipulation in a different way. So manipulation becomes a style out to get what you want, whenever you want, as you want, without paying for it. What do you do? All what you gotta do is say yes. All what you gotta do is say lie a little bit. All what you have to do is say, of course tomorrow will be a great day. I will take care of it, of course. And then you're gone. What's the big deal? Why is the Torah, why is Moses like the last seal? Hey, one thing you can never do, don't promise, don't talk. So, 
many answers, and I'm going to go step by step. The word neder, vowel in Hebrew, comes from the word dar. Dar means, is a, like dira, like an apartment. It's where do you live? When people ask you, where do you live? I live on Rodeo. I live on Crest. That's your apartment. That's, that's your life. That's where you are. That's your location. That's your house. When a person make neder, when a person make a vow, when a person make a promise, what happens when a person make a promise? His or her energy is going to the same place where they say they're going to be. Let's say you, you promise to give money in a certain day, in a certain place. It's not by mistake stay with you. you. The energy of what you're about to do is gone. The body of that energy is not gone. Meaning, let's say I said to you, I will meet you in Rodeo in five minutes. I'm actually in Rodeo in five minutes. But my body never met my spirit, my soul. And for that reason, there is a space between the body and the soul that allow negative energy to enter that thing. And then eventually problems start happening. For that reason, in the portion of Matot, it's a one thing Moses said before he died. So whatever you do, let me give you the best advice ever. Do ever promise, make a vow, or swear that you're going to do something. Don't. Do it. Why well, you got to promise? Why well, you got to promise? What do you gain by promising? You got attention, you got approval, you got acceptance, right? You got everything. My wife just showed me that somebody, somebody I know is a nice guy, copy one of the video I did two and a half years ago. It's called Acceptance. Somebody in New York asked me to make a video how to get the addiction of acceptance out from, uh, it was for New York and LA and Miami at that time. So he, he copied my video, said, oh, what do you say now? Somebody copy your video. So it's a big deal. I'm a writer, I write lecture for a lot of people. It's good. If it helps people, let it be, you know? And I wrote it. I deliver it. I mean, I didn't have many audience. I mean, it came. I mean, he got like 30,000 people. So God for it. Why not? Why not? So the idea is we need to get to a place that we're not promising. Can't. Rabbi Elimelech said, every person, because we were created in the image of God, say Rabbi Elimelech, so we need to understand who are you and where do you live? So the soul lives within the body. When you promise something, you are actually separating the soul from the body. You're almost killing yourself. It's dangerous. Kedushat Levi says it's another couple, it's another rabbi. Kedushat Levi's name is Rabbi Levi Tzchak Meberdichov. By the way, if you want to remember the name, you can listen again to the audio. And every time you have a problem, you say his name actually. When you have a big problem, you say this rabbi name, and right away you have miracle. And he writes like that. A person who's controlling his tongue, he can control everything in this life. Whoever controls his tongue, how you speak, I can promise you, say Rabbi Levi, you can control anything in your life, money, health, love life, whatever you want. But when a person cannot control his tongue, it can promise to that person that he cannot control his life. For that reason, the portion, say Rabbi Levi, is matot. Matot comes from the word la'atot. La'atot means to, to decide which direction the energy will go. Is it going to go good or bad? La'atot midin l'rachamim. To remove from judgment into mercy. That's what Rabbi Levi is teaching us. So from, from here we have a great lesson. It was a rabbi by the name of Chafetz Chaim. Chafetz Chaim was working on, him, on all his life. He wrote only books on, on how not to gossip. His whole life, he was writing about one subject. How not to gossip. And, you know, people in those days, they didn't recognize him as righteous. Today is number one. Like, this guy is unbelievable. There is streets in Israel after him. Then Chafetz Chaim. Not only that, there is a gentleman who, who built a brand here in LA called Tikkun Olam, those of you know what I'm talking about, is, is the same gentleman who invented the verse from the book of that rabbi that say, Lashon lo medaber lai. Evil speech not talking to me. It's all over Israel and every sign. It's coming to America too. It's actually, in, in, it's coming to LA first. And the idea 
Why that the need for evil speech? When you speak bad about someone, I'm not talking about when you lie, when it's the truth. You saw somebody stole something and you love telling the story about them. You watch the news, folks, it's CNN or others, or BBC, BBC America, and you read Wall Street Journal and you read New York Times, you read it all. Somebody's there, you gotta talk to them, some Lashonara. You gotta speak some dad about someone. You go to a wedding, what are you gonna do? I mean, we just talked on Shabbat. I don't know if you've ever been in a Persian wedding. I was one time, it was 650 people. That's a lot of people for me. You know, my wedding was 200 or maybe 100, and then 20. 600 is like tribe already, it's not family. So you're going there and you have tables. What are you gonna do? So you gotta judge something and then feed it with uh, gossiping. Yeah, I know the groom. <laughs> You know, the groom, let me tell you about the, the wife, the difference, the, oh, the shoes. Let me tell you where the, why? Why we have the need to do that? Where, where do we, we adopt it from? Say the, the Zohar telling us that that adoption of speaking bad come from the snake, the evil snake in the time of Adam and Eve. The first one to speak evil tongue was the snake. When he spoke about God to Eve. When he tell Eve, hey, listen, it's not that God don't want you to eat, you know? So what is, what is gossiping? How does it look like? You don't lie, but you choose to say the negative part about the truth. If you lie and you say negative about a person, it's not as bad, by the way. I know it's surprising you, because it doesn't have value. The energy is not there. But if you tell the truth about someone and it's negative, that by itself is a problem. So my thought, Talk a lot about vow, neither, promising, swear. You can swear, you can promise. And if you do, you have to make sure it's happening. For that reason, real righteous people don't promise things. They will say, I will try, I will do the best. And if they've been forced to promise, they say in the end of the verse, bli neither, mean bli without, neither vow. Meaning they're preparing you that I will do everything in my power. But if some force were preventing me, I'm sorry that I even promised right now. For that reason, before every Rosh Hashanah that we're going to do here, before Rosh Hashanah, we're gathering people together the day before, and you have to cancel all the vows you have indeed. Why? Because if you go to Rosh Hashanah without cancellation, you maybe bring the body, but the soul is still not here. The soul is in all the other places where you promise. And that's why people don't have power. So Rosh Hashanah, what you do, it doesn't matter what religion you are. You collect all the pieces of your soul back to your body, and now you can pray. But if you come to pray empty, just the body, there's no value. Same thing we do Yom Kippur. How do you open Yom Kippur? You do Kol Nidre. Again, the prayer of the vow. A different type of vow. I'm not going to go into details about it. So it's a very important to get an understanding of the value of your tongue. By the way, the Kabbalists don't call us human beings. They call us Chai Medaber, the creature that can speak. It's a weird thing, right? Weird name. The creature that can speak. Chai Medaber, the, li the, the living that can talk. Why they don't talk as human? Adam, human. And the idea that the right, that the power of a human being is only in this area, not with the muscles. Not the skills of how they run, not how they eat, how they function, how smart they are, how you talk. And more than that, the Talmud writes, if you want to know if somebody is stupid, you got to hear what they have to say. And it say, when a person is, how do you know if somebody is stupid in front of you? When they're overly talking about themselves. That's for sure you know the person is stupid, there's no reason to do business. Talmud, 2,000 years ago, that's what they write. Stay away, that's a waste of time. Eventually they will turn stupid. So when you, you hear people overly talking about themselves, you know, they use the word I. You know, I. I was worried about it because I'm, this afternoon I was just signing, um, somebody wanted me to do an interview on TV. So the first words came out of their mouth was I. 
And they'd be looking at me worried, say, come on, Eliyahu, let it go. And it was, well, I'm letting it go. I'm just telling you. The first was I. And then after three words was another I arrive. And after five words was another I. So I'm doing it, but I'm just preparing if it, something go wrong. <laughs> I knew why it might go wrong. But hopefully it will be good. It's an interview for the, one of the channel. So the idea is when you have too much I, somebody's going to do a mistake. Somebody will do a mistake. And the, the secret is how not to involve too much of the I when you speak. And try to do it. Try to do it at home. Try to do it. We, not me. Take the M, flip it, the W, it look we. That's it. That's not a lot, right? The M, pack, become W. Gone. You don't need to do a lot. So the whole idea of the nether, don't promise, don't swear, <laughs> almost sound like the movie theater. Don't text, don't call or something like that. <laughs> All of a sudden I heard myself saying, don't, and don't disturb the, the movie or something like that. I don't know. It's all of a sudden I heard it. It's so funny. And don't ruin the movie. That's, that's the words, right? Don't. So don't text, no, don't text, don't talk, don't promise, don't swear, don't make a vow, don't ruin your life, okay? Because your power is in your mouth. Can you imagine that whatever you say will happen? Would you, would you want a gift like that? There is rabbis and Kabbalists that add that power. They say it and it happened. They wish themselves one million dollars, happened the same day. Because the power of your mouth is so strong. Words as power. But to make sure that your mouth take back the power, you can promise. Because you get benefit when you promise. People start believing you. They follow you. And they forget what you even promised. So two years later, nothing. Husband promised a lot for, for, for their wife. Wife promised a lot for the husband. And then they get goonish. I mean, they get nothing in the end. They come back to the thing, nothing happened, nothing happened. I always tell people before they get married, I say if there is a little problem in your marriage and before the marriage, it will come twice as much or even three times more. Every problem triples itself after you get married. Because before the wedding is the facade, it's just a window, it's just beautiful. You know, like Macy's when they make the window before Christmas. It has to look good. When I'm going to show you what's wrong with me, I'm going to do presentation do a presentation and show you all the good things. After the wedding, uh, <laughs> a lot of things come out. So I always tell people, if you don't like that person before the wedding, I am expect, expect that problem will come more after. I had a couple who came to see me, and they, they, eventually they didn't do it with me. My wife blamed me for that. So they, they came, they traveled all the way in New Jersey. They want me to do their wedding. So we, I went to my office upstairs. And those of you who know me, you know, I'm not hiding anything. I said the way I speak very direct. I'm Israeli. What can I do? Can I help it? Scorpio Israeli. I say it in your face. So they want to get married. I ask why. I had to ask why. You know, they thought, yeah, this guy is a Kabbalist, rabbi, whatever, he's going to bless us. <laughs> I said, why do you want to get married? And they look at each other. That's weird. It was a weird moment. I shouldn't do it that rough. I, my wife was like, but I, I, I'm sure it will happen again. So they look at each other, like, I'm sure what they're feeling, like, what, how did we end up with this weirdo? And, and they look at each other, so what do you mean? I said, why, why do you want to get married? So, well, uh, we want to be the family. And I said, this is biologically proof that you can do it without getting married. And they get very confused, so, well, what's going on here? And I keep asking them some question. I never saw them again, by the way. That's <laughs> <laughs> what my wife, I said, my wife happened to be right. They gone. You know, I tried to have like a spiritual conversation. It, 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 was, it didn't go well. Um, no, I'm not doing it again, okay? Don't worry about it. I'm not doing it again. No, no. But I, I had to ask those few questions to awake the couples like, why you want to be together? It's not about the, that paper that you are married, or the chupa if it's Jewish, or the Christian if the, uh, you go in the church. I mean, why? You gotta have why. And uh, I want people to get to the why of a spiritual reason, that the two souls become one. You know, that's what I want. But it didn't, I didn't deliver it very well. I admit, I didn't. You know, I should say, that's the purpose of marriage, and things like that, 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 that. And would you like help to get there? I, at the end, I did it this way. Shouldn't I? I change? I change my style. But I want to share this with you because a lot of times the words that come out come out wrong because 
the person soul is not fully connected to the body. So I do mistake when I talk to people. I'm sure you do some mistake. All those mistakes are happening to us because we make promising that we don't keep. It's very dangerous. So I'm please asking you for your own good. Don't ruin your life. Write down whatever you promise. Write down the day. When you make a promise to somebody, stop. Look at the phone. Make the promise on the phone. Then tell them, I can do it on August 12th. But don't promise things that you can deliver. Don't ever. It's not you ruin their life. You ruin your life. It's, it's kill everything, everything uh, around you. Now I will tell you a true story. It's in the Talmud. It's a little scary movie. And you're not going to like me telling you that story, but I'm, actually it's not mine. So I'm reading to you a story from 2,000 years ago, okay? No, it's, it's, it's not a pleasant story because they didn't, there was no storyteller professional there. It was the teller the way it is. So the story is about a lady who's super wealthy and naive. She put her jewelry on her because her father was very rich and she's walking. But she never walked out of the house alone. And the Talmud said that she was lost and it was a hot day of August in the desert, let's say, of Israel, no water. And she saw a well of water. It was nothing there beside the well, hot day, clothing and jewelry. She didn't want to do it. She, said she tried to get the water, nothing. So she did something a little stupid. And she said, you know what? It's very scary to die from thirst. At least I'm going to go to the well and then I scream for somebody to come and get me out. I mean, think for yourself, what would you do? The Talmud said that she jump in, she start drinking the water, but she stay in the well. She cannot climb back. She starts screaming, help me, help me, help me. A gentleman actually came, happened to be there. And the gentleman was afraid because in those days, I don't want to scare you, demon used to hide in a well. I don't want to tell you too much about it. Not to let everybody panic. So he, he asked, there is all kind of question to ask. If you know what that, you know this, was your father, was your mother. Eventually she passed on the test. He said, I make a condition with you. Uh, if I save you, would you marry me? She said, yes, yes, just get me out of here. So I get her out of here. She saw him, he saw her, she was very young. Uh, he was young, let's say he was, she was like uh, 15 and a half. He was 18. It wasn't yet the right time. And so he said, she said, she liked him. He said, I actually like you. He said, I like you too, blah, blah, blah. Let's get married in five years. And she said to him, but what's, what's, how do you promise things like this? And she say, I'm going to take two witnesses. One witness is the well. The well will be my uh, uh, witness. And it was a rat passing by. And the rat will be my other witness. Now it's getting a little graphic, okay? So I'm sorry, it's not PG-13, so forgive me for that. So the story continue. That gentleman becoming a little bit older. The lady is waiting for him. She's in a different town. He never show up. The family pushing him to get married. The Jewish Orthodox guy, get married, get married, get married, get married. He get married with the, the girls and the parents fight. He forgot, five years later, he forgot. It was the promising and the rat. And the water, the, you get married, you have a child. In those days, it was in a house like now. And uh, again, it's a little graphic, forgive me for that. Uh, but I need to tell you a story from the Talmud. And somehow the first child died by being attacked by rat. I'm, I'm really shorting the story because they tell you the details of exactly what happened. The rat basically killed the, the first child. Yeah, because they believe in God, they continue with the marriage, everything is the same. In the meantime, the other girl is waiting. She gave birth to another kid, and the other kid, somehow, a baby, they're turning around from the baby, the baby roll to a water, get choked by water, and die. The wife, spiritual wife, Ask her husband, can't be that this is happening in our life. Can't be. Rat. 
second child, what, what, why, why, when she said rat, she said, wait a minute, oh my God. He started to realize what he promised the other girl. Say, I promised myself to be a husband to somebody else. The wife was not upset, he said, let's get divorced right now, right now, let's, let's finish it. Finish the marriage. And he went, of course, for the other girl, find her happy, everybody was happy, like Disney story of one of those things. But the sad part, of course, two kids die. The Talmud bringing that, not as a story, the Talmud, they bring it as the importance of not making a promise you can't keep or a promise that you might forget. If you make a promise to somebody, and even in our days, husband, wife, you promise anybody, it will block you for the rest of your life until you don't release that. And of course, it would be a wise idea on Rosh Hashanah, before Rosh Hashanah, to release any promise you made. Otherwise, it will hunt you in your money or in your health or in your relationship. So be careful with that. It's a very serious subject. So this is our first subject for tonight. Now we're going to move to the next subject. Any, any question on that? No? Good. So, yes, yes, please. I just want to verify. So you can Yuda, can I have a water, please? Water. You, you can make a promise. You just got to be able to keep the promise. You gotta keep the promise. Yeah, you gotta keep the promise. If, if you don't keep the promise, it's, uh, it's an issue. It's an issue. And, but if you make a nether, if you make a vow, or if you swear, then it's a problem. That's a big problem. Because nether means you are, say, I swear. You know? You say, I swear, I will do it. You know? People have a tendency to do it because they don't look at it like a big deal. People a lot of times say, What's the big deal? Just swear. You can't just swear because you are, you are words as energy. The, 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 one of the rabbi named Rabbi Shimchon Astrapoli asked the same question. One of uh, 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 the, the rabbi named Rabbi Shimchon Astrapoli asked a question when he said, what is the idea of not promising? He said, because your words, your action and thought create angels. So when you say something, you create angel. That angel that you created eventually become your advisor. If that angel is rotten, if that angel is not strong enough, the advice you're getting into your mind when you have thought, you know, people say, I was thinking about something. No, you were not thinking. You've been advising by some force you don't even see. We don't thinking. We are just a dish, you know, like a directive dish. And a thought come, an idea come. We are nothing. We are just a vehicle. You know, the mind is just a vehicle. Then the angels start to advise you with the wrong thing. Just be careful with the words. You know, if you have a tendency like me to talk a lot, you know, I have the thing. You know, my wife always tell me, you know, say it one time, please. You don't have to go from different corner, from this and that. One time, got it. You know, one and a half minutes is good. It's good. You know, in the beginning of our marriage, I used to do something not nice, but it's good to do some confession. I used to do, <laughs> she laughed. I used to do the talk in the car while I'm driving. When you do talk while you're driving, you can't, what are you gonna do with me? I'm talking, I'm driving and talking, she listening, where's she gonna go? Jump out of the window? So I'm talking and talking and talking. Yeah. So yeah, but the beginning of the marriage is a tough, it's a tough, uh, I always tell couples, you know, get a, be strong in the first few years and then it look better. The first few years, everybody expect the honeymoon in the beginning. I always tell people, you know, please save the money for later, okay? They tell me, what if it doesn't work? If it doesn't work, you save money anyway. What do you mean if it doesn't work? <laughs> Stupid. You want to spend the money in the first year and then it doesn't work? You know, people, people don't even think. The first five years, invested the, the money in that. After five years, now it's working. <laughs> Invest the money for that. That's why I don't like when people spend quarter million dollars for a wedding. I don't like that. And I think one of the reasons, and forgive me, I'm not trying to put down nobody. One of the reasons that person don't get divorced is because they say, oh my God, I just put half a million dollars in that, and then, yeah. Oh, it is true, it is true, oh, I just, I just guess it. I mean, they're afraid to get, they're afraid to get involved because they just put a quarter million dollars for Hilton or for the, over the Beverly Hills Hotel, my God, can't you do a small wedding and then 20 years do the big one, okay? See that it's working. And then they get something stuck with each other. It's a very sad thing, very sad. Anyway, I'm not gonna talk bad about it because it's not nice. But I'm just, I hope it was in a funny way. 
Now, the second subject tonight is the Masaot. There is 42 places where the Israelites went from one place to another. Now, why do we have to read where they have been? I mean, you're sitting there. I mean, that's good that you guys don't know Hebrew. So, otherwise, you will read. They left Ramses and they went to here. They left Bnei Yaakan and went to here. And this is the entire portion reading from here to there, from here to there, from here to there, from here to there. 42. Those of you who know what Anabe Koach is, Anabe Koach is a mantra that you must do at least twice, three times a day. It's a powerful mantra that if you do it right and you do it with all the covenant, you can even fly. You can fly. Today when I did a healing on a gentleman, wonderful man, wonderful man, he asked me something that nobody ever asked me before. He said to me, Eliyahu, can we do another quark together while you work healing on my body? I said, unique. I said to him, unique? I love it. Mm -hmm. I said, I'm in. So we did it together, the another quark, while I'm saging his body. It was so beautiful. I really enjoyed it. And if you're watching me, thank you. And the idea is to get into a place that every massa, that every travel from one point to another, why do you think you travel to Hawaii, or to London, or to Italy, or to Greece, or to places? What do you think there is a need to go there? What's the purpose? Every place that you go, you elevate something called Nitzotzot, spark. What is Nitzotzot? The soul has a relationship with that place. You can enjoy the pineapple, the food, and celebrate and dance, and everything. That's beside. But when you're there, we have tradition in our family that when I arrive to a place, I usually take a piece of fruit or food and I bless over that. Because by eating or by walking or by study, you elevate everything in that place to the next level. What do I mean by next level? There is four categories of reincarnation. Minerals, vegetables, animals, and human. When you eat with the right meditation, when you pray or study with the right meditation, when you walk with the right meditation, you can elevate everything into the next level until if there is reincarnation of human into dogs, cat, lizard, fish, minerals, you can elevate them back to become human being again. That's called elevation of nitzotzot, elevation of the spark. You elevate everything to where it needs to go. That's one thing you do. Second thing when you travel, what happened? You are actually getting into a place where if somebody has fear, fear can be split wrong fear, the right fear. Wrong love, the right love. Let's, let's discuss it for a second. Wrong fear, I'm afraid to lose money. I'm afraid I'm not gonna get a slice of pizza because only one left. I'm afraid I'm not gonna get enough salad. I'm afraid the bar doesn't have alcohol that I want. I'm afraid they're not going to love me. It's called the wrong fear. Because that fear has nothing to do with motivating you to become a better human being. It's actually motivating you to become more selfish and survive. That type of fear stay exactly, whenever you experience that fear, it stay in the land where you experience that fear. When the next person pass by, that negativity will affect that person. That's when you choose the table and restaurant, I know you have this app that you choose a table or you choose, I think, what do you call it? Choose a table? Open. Open table. But you don't know what you're actually choosing. You don't. Because if you choose the wrong table, that let's say somebody dump all their negativity, you actually pick up that negativity and take it home with you. It's going wherever you are. I mean, you don't have sage there. You start to do sage and feather from American Indian. Oh, you, 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 you. Can't do that. Look weird. Look weird. And it doesn't matter if it's organic food. It's, it's the table have it. Their thought, their talk, their action is there. When you go to hotels too, by the way. The last person who's been in a hotel, dump the energy and say, welcome to the room. It doesn't matter if you choose... 903 or 207 and the numbers match and perfect. Now, who was last there? That's the, the energy that left. So when Israel, when the Israelites walk from Egypt, slavery mentality, what does a slavery mentality look like? It doesn't mean work for the Egyptian. Slavery mentality means when a person is a victim. Victim.com, blaming everybody else for what's not working for them. Lead 
leader mentality is when I say, I'm not care if it's my fault or not, I'm here to make a difference. And we have, we have a discussion today about wrong ego and good ego. Wrong ego is when you are too shy to do the right thing. Right ego, that you don't care people say you have ego because you're doing the right thing. That's the right ego. If you already have ego, then do something about it. Don't change. Many people go to spiritual organization, they tell them, you have too much ego. So you see that? I, I, I wish somebody would attack me one time with, maybe I'm welcome, somebody to tell me I have too much ego. I will answer, I don't have enough. You gotta help me have more. I need more ego. And you gotta help me with that. I don't get those people who tell people you have too much ego. Ego is justification. Somebody have ego and they think himself or herself big, let them think, why does it bother you? Why does it bother people, people are arrogant or this or that? If it doesn't bother you, they wanna feel, they wanna drive the Lamborghini in Rodeo Drive and they want to see no car in the street and when they walk out, they want some uh, violin and guitar and everything, oh, da, 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 I'm here. What's your business? Why are you so jealous? Let them be. If those people have so much ego, now I'm gonna tell them, hey, listen, we need to save few people in the world. Would you like to help me? That's what the ego needed for. But the one who's shy, no, I don't wanna show off too much. I'm gonna wear shoes for the last four years, the same shoes. So I don't wanna even let people see me. That for me is the worst ego. Not the one with the Lamborghini. Those people can save life for people if they want. But the one who stay home because they think they want to work on being humble, what are they going to do for the world? Busy being shy? Busy beating themselves for the ego? There's nothing there. There's nothing there. It's like they're born, they die, and in between, what happened? Nothing. I like those people who make noise. I like the people who make what people say, oh, they're making a mess. Yeah, but we can change them. We can transform. We can take them to a place where it can be better. Those are the people we're looking for. Unfortunately, the next generation, whoever is 18 and above till 25, the next generation is working on being nothing. They have a goal. How can we be quiet? How can we be humble? Because they see the parents, the parents are, whoever is 18, their parents are the children of the, what they call in America, I think, what do you call that name? Baby, baby boomers. Baby boomers, eh? parents, and now we have the next generation, I don't know, 17 or 15, so one, two, three. So the baby boomer, right? I have to survive. Slap the kids in the, in the, in the face, just survive, make a living, make a money, go study something. Baby boomer. Yeah, the, 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 Children of them, I have to break the rules, I have to do drugs, I have to enjoy Jimi Hendrix. I don't care about nothing, right? Then come the children of the Jimi Hendrix situation, if they survive. If they survive after all the drugs, then they come and they are, look at the parents, the parents are weird, the weirdo. Because the parents are confused in between rules of the grandparents and having fun. And now they try to reinvent themselves. Usually when they're 45, they start waking up like, okay, I got to do something with my life. What do I want to do with my life? And now they have a kid who look at the parents who are acting like kids. So now the children start, I'm talking psychology, this is not Kabbalah. The children start acting a little different. And they will talk about how not to social. And thank God we invented Facebook, Instagram, what else you got? Snapchat, uh, the other one, WhatsApp. You know, you got it all. So you have thousand million friends. You never met them, but you have them. You know, and then this is life. What do you call life? Sad. It's not life. So when you go to a place, as the Torah telling you, Masa'eh, you elevate every type of energy that somebody put there. So the Israelites went to places where it was a fake fear. Not real fear. It wasn't a fear, maybe I'm not doing the right job, so let me motivate myself to do the right job. They had to elevate the wrong fear into the right fear. Then they went to places where there was the wrong love. Kivrota ta'ava, it's called. The burial of the ta'ava, of the lust. Sometimes you have lust, is lust is love. Well, you love, you love passionately, you have sex, you love. Not all the time, because the, the love, that people talk about is, is a killer. 
That's why people love the song from Foreigner. I, I want to know what love is. Everybody's dying to know what love is, right? I want to know what love is. So when people think about love, is how can I fulfill my desire? It's not how I can feel somebody else's desire, right? I had a wonderful lady. She is from Wall Street. Uh, introduced to a guy from Germany. He's a doctor, medical doctor. So she's my, my, my client. He's my client. I thought maybe you should, both of you are not married. And I remember after the first date, she's, I don't know if you know Aries, first call from her, Wall Street girl, Aliyah. Aliyah, that's what you do. So what? Are, are, are you joking? So what, what's wrong? I said, is, is it good looking? He has hair because the last guy I introduced you didn't have hair. So he has hair, <laughs> he has a long hair. He, he, he speak uh, three languages. Uh, uh, he has money, he's highly educated, he has great pro Elio! So what's wrong with you? She's from Wall Street, if you know the building before it was destroyed, one, it's called Wall Street One, I think. One World Trade. What do you call it? One World Trade. One World Trade. Yeah, one, yeah. That's <laughs> I said, no, you don't, no, 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 Elio. I mean, if you tell me, I believe in you, but this guy can be destroyed by me in about three hours. There will be nothing left. And then I told her something that she gave me a second chance. I said, listen, my dear, what is love? She's, you know, she's a businesswoman. I said, love, you know, it's like stock. You got it right, you got the right timing, right thing, you know it. So yeah, yeah, yeah. But love is also not what's good for you. You have to start thinking, are you good for him? And at that moment, she stopped talking. So what? I said, would you ever think, am I actually good for him? I want you to think about it. She become my best friend after that. Not my client, my best friend. And for years, we know each other so many years. They get married, they children and all that. The beautiful story, love is about what can you do for the other human being? Not what the other human being can do for you. And I know that a lot of people, you know, are sick and tired of looking for the right one. But we have to think from this energy, you know, it used to be, I mean, before my time, people used to go out to, to a place to meet each other, you know? It's still naive. If you go to Jerusalem, you see it. It's still there. If you ever join, there is places in Jerusalem. When you see people don't know about any app, they just meet each other in a hotel and they introduce each other. It's, pure, it's still pure. Then came the match.com or all the other dot com, da 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 da. And people meet each other, people get tired of that. Christian.com, Jewish.com, Muslim, uh, farmer, there's farmer too, right? <laughs> the non-farmer, non city. <laughs> then came a new one, the Tinder. Tinder, am I saying it correctly? Oh, that's, that's catch. This is it. We found the solution for all the problem. I don't want to know you. I don't want to love you. I just want to use you. Do you want to use me? Yeah, can I use you too? Okay, let's use each other. <laughs> Done! Done! I'm wonderful! And everybody go do whatever they want. Next thing, next thing, done. I mean, I'm not that old, but for me it was kind of how far that go. And, it, and it's going forward, by the way. <laughs> I don't want to tell you more than that. And some of you maybe don't. Well, and people call it love. People call it love. What's shocking me more than anything, that people need get fulfilled, they call it love. And I always mention to them that old joke, say, do you love fish? So of course. So that's why you kill it and eat it, right? You kill the fish and eat it. That's why you love it so much. The love association with the human brain is what I want fulfilling me. That's called, in Kabbalah, the wrong love. So when the Israelites went to the desert, they have to pick up all the area which was wrong love into the right love. They had to create a transformation from the wrong love to the right love. Because the love is people attached to. The love that people attach to is unfortunately a love of the selfishness. The selfishness that is bringing a person into what have you done for me today? And when people live in their brain like that, days and night, 
the usual result will be disaster, nothing. And for that reason, in the portion of Mas'eh, in the portion of Mas'eh, the Israelites are moving from one place to another to elevate the wrong love, to elevate the wrong fear. And through that, when you elevate everything to the right place, it's called la vida varle shosho, to elevate everything to the roots where it's come from. Because why are you afraid? Why are you addicted to something? Why? Do you ever ask yourself, what is addiction? If we define addiction not by psychology. Addiction is when you love something, but you have no control over that love. That love has no more boundaries. So you are actually no longer capable of loving it with the free will. You are addicted to it. You have to have that. It's not, I choose to have that, I have to have that. And when I have to have something, we call it an addiction. And then when you call it an addiction, what happened? What happened to you? You don't judge yourself. You say, nothing is wrong with me. What am I doing? I'm just fulfilling my need. I just want that to be in my mouth. I want this to be in my nose. I want that to touch my body. Can't help it anymore. It can't help it. There's no more free will. One of the worst things, one of the punishments of addict, that they lose one thing, only one thing, free will. You no longer have a free will. Addict lose only one thing, no more free will. Because in the beginning, you think you have free will, then you realize you don't have free will, then you don't care you don't have free will anymore. It just, it's not that the cocaine chose by you. The cocaine chose you. It's not that you take in cocaine, the cocaine take you. It's not that you take the drugs, the drugs take you. It's not that you take the food, the food take you. It's not that you making love, the making love make you, if, if that makes sense in English, right? I mean, the whole thing is no longer, you're not the boss anymore. For that reason, in the portion of Mas'eh, the Israelite was walking from one place to another to elevate those things, to elevate. And the Ari is telling us that every place, every place where they went as elevation of a different thing, 42 places. And if you don't hear those 42 places, and I'm not trying to threaten you or scare you, you gotta hear this Shabbat, this Saturday when you hear the Torah reading, hear every place and say, okay, now I'm elevating that. Now I'm elevating that. When you elevate all whatever was wrong fear or wrong love, when I say wrong love, I wanna make sure it's clear. Wrong love meaning that I'm not thinking what am I doing for what I love? I'm thinking that what I love do think for me. That's wrong love. So it's not, and for that reason, love has to have boundaries. Boundaries not in a sense that you should not love enough. Boundary in a sense that I have to check myself, why am I loving you? Am I loving you because I'm using you? Or am I loving you because I think there is something in me that can benefit you? I'm good in something and I think that it'd be good for you. One of the funny things, before my wife and me get married, she asked me, is there something you want to tell me? Say, there is one thing you need to know about me. And, and I'm embarrassed to say it, but I have to say it to you. You remember what it was? <laughs> it's a funny story, but you know, after so many years, it's, it's funny, we can laugh about it. So I was so nervous to tell her, and she was start to worry, you know, when the men start to sweat before he's speaking. So what's going on here? What's happening? Doesn't look good. I said, listen, uh, I, I don't know how to tell you this, but it's about time that I'm being man enough to tell you, uh, I can kill cockroaches. And she started laughing in my face. I'm like sweating. The old man side of me is kind of falling apart. And, and she said, are you serious? So yeah. So, so it's very big for me and I'm very embarrassed that I'm not man enough to do that. All men do that. I'm the only man that I know on this planet who cannot do, deal with it. And I'm really, really sorry. And I'm in tears, like, I don't know what to do about it. I tried therapy, I tried everything, it didn't work. They can't kill cockroaches. <laughs> She's laughing, I'm emotionally. It was a funny moment. You remember that? Uh, it was terrible. I mean, I can do, I said I can cook, I can do a lot of good things, but this is one area that I'm, 
I'm, I have a difficult time with that. Still can do it, those of you who know me, can still working on it, you know? You know, so it's almost like funny. So what happened? My wife got pregnant with Yehuda, first boy. So I'm teaching in front of a big crowd of people. It was, I think it was here in LA. Yeah, it was in LA. And in those days, we didn't have a phone. We have a, a what do you call it? The, the black uh, the beeper, the beeper in the side. So you put it on Vibe for if it's 911. So I'm teaching, and it's, it's a workshop for three hours with meditation and standing and angels. And after two hours, I'm happy. The crowd are happy. Everybody's into it. And I'm looking at the people. It's 911. For, for, the, for my home phone. My home, my little room. I had the little... So I said, oh my God. I, I said, I take a break from the lecture. I said, everybody is okay. Um, I'm calling and say, uh, my wife, is everything okay? Say, no, it's not okay. So what's going on? She said, there is a giant creature in our house. I cannot leave the room with the baby. I'm hugging the baby strong. Say, I said, okay, let's, let's cool. I'm sound like the 911 secretary. Let's cool it out, take a deep breath, and tell me the size of the creature, okay? Compared to your hand. Is it bigger than your finger? It's way bigger, okay? Is it bigger than the whole palm of your hand? Is it, it's like, yes, way bigger. So, okay, this is, this is a problem. So I said, I don't know what to do. Should I send it to somebody or I come myself? No, you gotta come. It's a creature. So I said, what did you do? I said, I closed the shower and I put towels under so it doesn't go under the door. So somebody placed me in the lecture and I'm run to the house, didn't even take a car. Remember that? I arrive, so where's the creature? So I'm ready with, with <laughs> me and my friend, we came together. It's a big creature. I don't know how we get to the shower. So we see this little, I described for the camera, this little cricket. That's my tikkun, that's how it's come back from the cockroaches. And I start laughing, she starts laughing, and I don't know what happened, but the idea, I look at it like, this was a, a circle of me telling her I'm afraid of cockroaches, and that's appear as a creature, closing a circle. And the reason I share this with you, because love is not at all how you benefit from the union. And if it's your drive how to benefit from the union, it's not love. It's a use. It's how can I use you? So maybe people should do not match.com or how, how can I use you.com. And maybe that's what Tinder, you know, we talked about Tinder before, which is mostly, I, I think, it's about sex. I never saw the site, but what I understand, it's about physical connection. I'm not, again, judge it at all. I'm not against it. I'm not have an opinion even on that, you know? But I believe, based on the story, that there is some, can I use your body, please? Okay, can I use your body, please? With permission, and it's good for the other side, yeah but I have to use your body too, kind of no problem. So are we using the body of each other? So there is no love there, there is a use of body, but the good news that I hear from two people, that two people get married because of that. So I'm kind of excited, and until I don't study the subject fully, I cannot speak bad or good about it to understand how exactly it works, because if I heard that two couples happen because of sex, so maybe, I don't think I'm old, but maybe it's a different generation that it starts with sex and then it turns into love later. Maybe this is what's going on. Maybe that's how it works. You know, you don't go to a hotel and talk, hi, my name is Muki Chuki Tuki, I do this. And then, hi, nice. Wow, he paid for the coffee. And, uh, different time. Now it's, wow, sex was good. Now let me give him a chance to go to a bar or something. It's a different time. So the whole idea of Masa'e, the whole idea of Masa'e, the whole idea of the traveling, is basically to pick up all kind of thing that you did wrong during the year. Pick it up, fear, wrong fear, wrong love, and you pick it up. What I want you to do right now, before we say, you, you speaking tonight now? You speaking? You are? Yes, no? Yeah. Yes, you are? Yeah. Oh, okay. So Debbie's speaking tonight, so I'm just gonna ask you to close your eyes for a second before Debbie's speaking, I didn't know speaking, so. Um, and what I want you to do, I want you please to invite one, one soul, one person, whatever they are with the living or they're already gone. 
somebody you have an issue with. And I want you to be able to let them go. Just let them go. If you can forgive them, great. If you can't, just forget about it. Just let them go. And believe that by you letting them go, that type of energy will never be back in your life again. Um, so I'm just going to share a short story with you. We're before Rosh Hashanah, and Eliyahu was speaking about one of the Kabbalists by the name of Rabbi Elimelech, and I had just um, read a story about him. So the story goes like this. There was a man who lived in the same town as Rabbi Elimelech, who was a great Kabbalist. And from a young age, this man felt like everything he did was negative. And he, was, he felt guilty, and he felt like he couldn't do repentance. I'm sharing this with you because we're right before the time of the high holidays, which we think of as we need to do repentance and we need to look inside. So he's not an old man. He's probably in his 20s. But he feels like when he was a teenager, he did really bad things. And all this time, he's been... Um, feeling guilty and he's fasted twice a week and everything that you can think of to try and purify yourself he's doing and the feeling of guilt is not going away so he decides one day that he's gonna go to Rabbi Elimelech and ask him for help so he goes to the Kabbalist and as he walks in Rabbi Elimelech looks at him and he says you know what I understand your problem he says I'm sure you feel like Nothing that you do is going to change all of the negativities you did. But you know, we have this thing that only once a year should you feel so guilty about everything you've done that you, you just want to be broken and cry. And that day is designated, it's called Yom Kippur. On that day you can fast, you can make sure that you feel guilty, you can open your heart. But if you feel like that every day, then the dark side or satan or however you want to call it is playing tricks with you because you feel like that every day so you don't enjoy life at all and so you can't even connect to what you did he said there's a process that you need to do the process sounds easy the process is easy you feel bad for what you did you verbalize the the sorrow and the guilt that you feel for it and then you promise not to do it again, and you try your best. And the next day you wake up with happiness, and you enjoy and you appreciate what you have. But if every day you go into this depression and into this guilt and into this negativity, then it's, it's old. You can't really connect to it. So he says to him, go home. I want you to go home for two weeks. I want you to be happy. I want you to enjoy life eat the best food, because he was fasting, he was really, really skinny, eat the best food, and come back to me in two weeks. So the guy is perplexed, but he does it. He goes home, he has wine, and he has food, and he enjoys his life, and he's happy. And after two weeks, he comes back, and Rabbi Elimelech sits with him, and he says, okay, now we're going to start. And he says, sit in a meditation, and think of everything that you've done that you feel bad for. And the man starts crying. And he's feeling the pain and the sorrow of what he did and what he caused people. And that's something that he couldn't connect to before because he was so busy with it. It overwhelmed him. It took over everything of his being. So he couldn't truly connect to what he did. So what does it mean for us? That yes, we need to stop and we need to look inside and we need to come to the holidays prepared, but not every second. Because if every second we feel guilty, we'll never enjoy life and we'll never know the difference.